I'm Jacob McDonough, founder and portfolio manager of McDonough Investments. I manage a concentrated portfolio of stocks for clients in a separately managed account structure. In this episode of the 10K Podcast, I'm going to go through the 1976 annual report for GEICO. So far, I've covered the 1974 and 75 annual reports for the company. In this episode, the most important event was that Jack Byrne entered the picture. John J. Byrne, who went by Jack, grew up around the insurance industry. His father owned a small insurance company, and Jack did some work there growing up. After college and after serving in the Air Force, Byrne started working as an actuary at an insurance company. Eventually, he climbed the ranks at Traveler's Insurance to executive vice president. But once he was passed over for the president role at Traveler's, he decided to take on the challenge at Geico. In May of 1976, Byrne became chairman, president, and CEO of Geico. Reading the 1974 and 1975 annual reports for Geico left me with the impression that there was complacency in the organization. There was none of this in the 1976 annual report, as Byrne appeared to operate with a sense of urgency. He was elected by the board to be the leader of Geico on May 5, 1976. On May 13, Geico decided to stop doing business in New Jersey. I'll get to why that was an important point later. On June 11th, Byrne announced a three-phase recovery plan involving Operation Bootstrap, quota share reinsurance, and a capital financing program. The first phase refers to underwriting profitability, while the second two phases focus on raising capital and reducing risk. Byrne describes Operation Bootstrap as a vigorous program by the management team, portions of which were already in place, I believe he means even before he took over, to improve immediately the financial results from internal operations. So he is basically saying that they have to immediately improve their underwriting and their financial results. The plan has a good name. I like it. But more importantly, internal operations turned around during the year. At the beginning of the annual report, Geico breaks down the results quarter by quarter. Byrne took over in May, so the second quarter was already nearing the halfway point. Geico had an underwriting loss of $27.8 million in the first quarter of 1976, followed by an underwriting loss of $21.4 million in the second quarter. By the third quarter, the underwriting loss was down to $7.3 million, followed by a loss of just $3.7 million in the fourth quarter. Operations seemed to be improving. Importantly, investment income amounted to $9 million in the third quarter and $8.8 million in the fourth quarter, exceeding the underwriting loss for those quarters. This means that Geico was able to report positive net income in the third and fourth quarters of 1976. I'm sure the company was already making changes to improve before Byrne got there, and the industry might have recovered a bit too. But Geico was back to profitability very shortly after Byrne arrived on the scene. Maybe Operation Bootstrap was more than just a cool name. The following quote from the annual report shows that Geico was getting back to basics, back to its bread and butter. Your management firmly believes that the quickest way for Geico to return to underwriting profitability is to do what the company has traditionally done best. Therefore, Geico is concentrating heavily on attracting and selectively underwriting high-quality insurance risks, primarily through direct marketing methods. The second phase of the plan was obtaining quota share reinsurance. Reinsurance is when two or more insurance companies do business with each other. One insurance company insures another. This example with Geico is a common reason why reinsurance takes place. Geico didn't have enough capital to take on the risks from its policies, while there are other insurance companies out there with plenty of capital who are looking to take on more insurance risk. There was some competitive dynamics, though, that could have kept this reinsurance from happening. Geico was a tough competitor who might have been facing bankruptcy. So if other insurance companies helped save it, that meant having to compete with Geico in the years to come. To be fair, Geico probably would have emerged from bankruptcy and remained intact as a company, so eventually Geico would reemerge as a competitor in the industry either way. Most likely, the stockholders of Geico would have lost their entire investment before Geico was recapitalized as a new organization. Geico was relying on its competition to lend a helping hand. 
Also, Geico's business was very unprofitable during this time period, so reinsurers might have wanted to stay away from these unprofitable insurance policies. This reinsurance agreement potentially stretched past 1980, though, so the reinsurers might have found it likely that Geico would return to profitability eventually. Geico would, would receive a 15% seating commission from the reinsurance companies, which I think of as a sales commission, since Geico was bringing this business to the reinsurance companies. The agreement stipulated that the reinsurance companies could cancel this agreement any time after the end of 1977 with six months' notice, which I assume they would only do if they estimated this business would continue to be highly unprofitable. Geico could cancel this reinsurance agreement if the inception to date combined ratio for the reinsurers was below 98%. So if Geico returned to being highly profitable and felt confident about its capital position, it could eventually get out of this reinsurance arrangement. 27 insurance companies joined in to split the premiums in this quota reinsurance agreement, which was signed on December 2, 1976, but was effective going back to June 30, 1976. Importantly, Geico was able to achieve the third phase of its plan and raise capital. On August 17, Solomon Brothers offered to underwrite the capital offering. Then, on December 2, Geico shareholders and industry participants bought the entire preferred stock offering, so Solomon Brothers didn't have to sell any of it to the general public. The offering was fully subscribed. Geico raised $75 million by selling convertible preferred stock. Each preferred share of stock could be converted into two shares of common stock. This led to Warren Buffett getting back involved with Geico after having previously invested in the company in the 1950s. Berkshire Hathaway bought about a quarter of the preferred stock offering, investing $19.4 million into the preferred stock, while also buying $4.1 million of common stock. Berkshire owned about 15% of Geico after these 1976 investments. Together, the capital raise and the reinsurance transactions raised Geico's statutory surplus by $91.5 million. Byrne announced this three-phase plan in June, and by the time he's writing his letter in the 1976 annual report looking back on the year, he's able to say that we executed the plan. The objectives of each of the three elements were met. Our company ended 1976 with approximately $137 million of surplus for the protection of policyholders, which means capital. And we managed to achieve a net income in the fourth quarter of approximately $8 million. Impressive results, Mr. Byrne. But as you continue reading the report, you can see that Byrne isn't done yet. I criticized the tone of Geico's previous management over the last few years. To me, they were acknowledging the difficulties of the period, but were attempting to reassure investors and project confidence. In the case of Jack Byrne, he was able to turn Geico around and report positive net income in the fourth quarter. Despite that profitability on a net basis, the firm still had an underwriting loss. Byrne wrote that, we continue to suffer losses from our automobile insurance underwriting, a completely unacceptable situation. The solving of this problem is receiving our full attention. We are cautiously optimistic that it can be solved during 1977. He says that underwriting losses are a completely unacceptable situation. Later, the annual report says that the loss ratio of 99% in 1976 is clearly unacceptable. That is exactly what you want to see in an insurance executive. Geico has a cost advantage, which I mentioned before. Now, as long as the firm can underwrite profitably, then this can be a company that returns to being very successful. Byrne was out there taking action. I mentioned Geico decided to leave the state of New Jersey. This was a major decision. New Jersey accounted for 9.7% of the written premiums at Geico in 1975. Most importantly, though, a quarter of all of Geico's involuntary automobile insurance policies were in New Jersey. As I mentioned in the last two episodes, the involuntary auto business was highly unprofitable. The regulators in the state of New Jersey assigned these policies out to the company, and Geico had little say in the matter as long as they did business in the state. Exiting New Jersey, although painful, would really help the prospects of profitable underwriting at Geico. It would take some time to fully exit New Jersey, though, as Geico still had to fulfill the insurance contracts it already had established. Back then, car insurance policies might have lasted about a year or so before they were up for renewal. 
Geico wouldn't be renewing any policies in New Jersey, so after about a year, their exit from the state would be complete. Byrne wrote an editorial explaining why Geico left the state in New Jersey. Let me read the letter to you in full. Why did Geico leave New Jersey? On May 13, 1976, I surrendered our license to do business in New Jersey. This action subsequently caused us to refuse renewal of Geico automobile and homeowners policies to over 250,000 New Jersey policyholders, an important and treasured group of customers developed over the 26 years of our business in that state. This action was widely discussed in the media and in responses to our policyholders by both the authorities of New Jersey and by us. The action was particularly painful to me. Not only did I recognize the important portion of Geico's history we were exercising, but New Jersey is my home state and my family remains active in the insurance business there. In view of all this, I believe our shareholders should know why we took this action. First of all, the insurance industry losses on automobile insurance in New Jersey have been incredibly large. Our own underwriting losses in the state from 1974 through the last day of coverage for the last New Jersey policyholder will easily run, run well over $50 million. Of course, not all of this was caused by the state regulatory authorities or the unusually restrictive laws, but the industry attempts to correct the situation through desperately needed increases in premium rates were repeatedly met with delays, requests for additional data, and compromises, which simply served to delay and make more burdensome the inevitable. In mid-1975, with the intervention of the public advocate, additional roadblocks and compromises were experienced. At our meeting with the insurance commissioner on May 13th, we asked that he approve the 19% automobile rate increase we had requested a month earlier, and further, that he grant the desperately needed rate increases which the industry had requested for the assigned risk plan. Um, assigned risk means the involuntary portion of the business. As an alternative to the latter, Geico requested relief from assignments under the plan until industry rate relief could be granted. The commissioner neither granted our request nor gave us much encouragement for the future. It was my judgment that we had no alternative but to abandon this valued family of policyholders. We agreed to an orderly withdrawal plan, which is well underway. By August 27, 1977, we will no longer be insuring automobiles in New Jersey. In December, as a result of their continued frustrations and attempts to obtain a reasonable rate, several other major companies announced material restrictions on their insuring activities in the state. There is an insurance crisis in the state of New Jersey. Having recently raised new capital from external sources, principally from you, our shareholders, your company will not jeopardize our improved financial position, nor our position with policyholders in other states, by considering a return to New Jersey in this current environment. John J. Byrne. Additionally, the book The Snowball has some interesting commentary on this event. I'm going to read an excerpt from it now. Byrne needed a 35% rate increase in New York and speedily got it. In New Jersey, Byrne went to the decaying old capital of Trenton to plead with the commissioner. Byrne marched into the commissioner's office with a copy of the company's license in his pocket and told the commissioner that Geico must have a rate increase. He said his numbers did not justify a rate increase. Byrne says, I did all the arm waving and stuff I could and the commissioner was intractable. Byrne pulled the license out of his pocket and threw it on the desk of the commissioner saying, I have no choice but to turn in the license or something to that effect, but containing more four-letter words. He then drove back to the office with tires screeching, sent out telegrams to 30,000 policyholders canceling their insurance, and fired 2,000 New Jersey employees in a single afternoon before the commissioner could go to court and get an injunction to stop him. It showed everybody, all audiences, I was serious about this, recalls Byrne, and that I was going to fight for the life of the company no matter what, including walking out of a state which wasn't done back then. Wow. First off, Byrne surrendered Geico's license to do business in New Jersey on May 13th. He was announced as CEO on May 5th. That's about a week. He moved quickly. He didn't get the rate increase he needed at the meeting, so he threw Geico's insurance license on the desk right there at that same meeting. He didn't wait another minute. 
As a comparison, the former management of Geico spent months picking an actuarial consultant during a time of crisis. Byrne took action. To be clear, this was a painful decision. Geico had more than 250,000 customers in New Jersey. The company had spent 26 years de developing its business in that state, investing plenty of money in it over time. Now Geico is heading towards having zero business in that state. From a short-term profitability standpoint, this was a great decision though. And remember, this was a time of crisis, so Geico had to be focused on profitability for survival and had to be focused on regaining the trust of customers and the general public. It was a bold move, but it signaled a change at Geico. Policies in force dropped by 26% in 1976, mostly from the decision related to New Jersey. This was a company completely focused on growth prior to Byrne taking over. Now the focus has shifted to profitability and Geico shrinking its business is evidence of management's commitment to profitability. In 1976, all marketing programs were suspended and most sales offices were closed. Management stated that, The primary thrust of Geico's marketing strategy in 1977 is being directed toward improving the quality of the company's book of business. They go on to say that they are focusing only on jurisdictions with expectation of profit. And later they say they are non-renewing drivers who don't qualify as preferred risk due to driving record. They mentioned that they are losing some customers to bad press and that they're suspending marketing and closing sales offices. In some types of businesses, these types of actions might cause managers to fear they will lose too many of their customers. Luckily for Geico, the auto insurance business can have solid customer retention rates, and Geico's customer base was no exception. It was a sticky business. It's just easier for people to continue on with their same old insurance plan. Auto insurance is a requirement. People might look for a deal originally, but a lot of customers often stay with the same insurance company for many years. Despite the large increase in the number of customers it had, Geico's premiums written only declined by 4.9% for the year. This was a result of Geico increasing its prices. Voluntary automobile policy premium rates increased 18% in 1975 and 38% in 1976 on a countrywide basis. This shows that the company was getting back on track with its pricing. At the same time, the company reduced its staff by 17.2% and would have less marketing expenses as well. The firm would need less employees in general since it was shrinking in size, but I'm sure plenty of the employees in marketing and sales probably had to find work elsewhere at this time. Geico was on its way back to becoming a profitable enterprise. When Geico was able to successfully raise capital, its ratio of premiums written to statutory surplus fell to a much more manageable level. Geico was levered four to five times leading up to this difficult period, and then the ratio skyrocketed to 13 times in 1975 due to the underwriting losses Geico sustained. By the end of 1976, this ratio was down to three times. Not only were operations showing signs of improvement, but the capital strength of Geico was, was restored. In past episodes, I mentioned how Warren Buffett wrote in 1974 about how many insurance companies were under reserve. Now that some more time has passed, we had even more evidence of this statement being true. In the 1976 annual report, Geico wrote that payments in 1975 for accidents that occurred during 1974 and prior years, plus the reserves for those accidents at December 31st, 1975, exceeded by approximately $67.9 million the reserves at December 31st, 1974. Management put a table up in the 1976 annual report showing the ratio of reserves to earned premiums for Geico. In 1973, Geico's reserves were $247.8 million, which was just 49.9% of premiums earned. By the end of 1976, Geico had $430.5 million worth of reserves, which was 66.7% of premiums earned. Geico had far higher reserves compared to premiums earned in 1976 than had been the case in the years leading up to this period which helps to show more evidence that Geico was in a more conservative position at this point in time. The stock price hit a low of $2.13 per share in the third quarter of 1976, 
and recovered to a high of $7.13 per share in the fourth quarter, up 3.3 times in a short period. With that being said, the stock price was still far below the high of $27.25 per share from the first quarter of 1975, not to mention the $58.88 per share from 1973. From the peak in 1973 to the low in 1976, the stock price declined 96.4%. Even though Geico was getting back on track and looked poised to avoid bankruptcy, the shareholders of the stock were still facing major dilution. Assuming the convertible preferred stock eventually was converted into common shares, then the shares outstanding just about doubled. Another way to think about this is that shareholders who owned Geico prior to this period just saw their percentage ownership in Geico get cut in half. Things could be worse though, as half of something is worth more than all of zero. So shareholders should be thankful the organization survived. In the fourth quarter of 1976, the stock price reached a high of $7.13 per share. Including dilution from the convertible preferred stock, this valued Geico at $244.1 million. As long as Geico got back to its old way of doing business and was able to achieve historical profitability, then there was hope that Geico could grow back into this valuation. Assume you wanted earnings of at least 10% of this valuation, or $24.4 million of net income. Geico earned close to this amount or more each year, each year from 1971 to 1974. The firm earned $32.6 million after tax in 1972, which would be a yield of over 13% for shareholders. Earlier, I mentioned that Berkshire Hathaway invested in Geico during 1976. This was a major investment for Berkshire. In 1976, Berkshire's wholly owned insurance subsidiaries wrote $94.8 million of total premiums. Berkshire's 15% share of Geico's net premiums written would have been $71.4 million in 1976. Since Berkshire only owned 15% of Geico, its share of Geico's premiums were not consolidated within Berkshire's financial statements. However, if you consider Berkshire's share of Geico's premiums as its own business segment within Berkshire, then it would have been the largest segment within the Berkshire Hathaway Insurance Group. The traditional national indemnity business wrote $60.9 million worth of premiums. Reinsurance would have been the next largest segment with $15.8 million in premiums written that year. Geico had total assets of $911.8 million in 1976, so Berkshire's share of those assets would have been $140.4 million. Berkshire's total assets were $283 million in 1976. I just give these figures to show that Berkshire's investment in Geico was a meaningful part of its insurance operations starting in 1976. By 1980, Berkshire's share of Geico's premiums eclipsed that of the Berkshire Hathaway Insurance Group. Additionally, Berkshire's subsidiaries produced an underwriting profit of $6.7 million in 1980, while Berkshire's share of Geico's underwriting profit amounted to $56.8 million that year as Geico became highly profitable. In a unique situation, Berkshire wasn't able to have any say in the operations of Geico. The company wasn't able to use its shares for any voting power, and you didn't see Warren Buffett join the board or the investment committee or anything like that. In the 10K for 1976, it says that, Pursuant to an order of the Superintendent of Insurance for the District of Columbia, exempting Berkshire Hathaway Inc. from certain requirements of the District of Columbia Holding Company System Regulatory Act, Berkshire authorized the Suburban Trust Company of Wheaton, Maryland, to vote all of the common and preferred stock of Geico held by Berkshire. The agreement calls for Suburban to vote the shares according to Suburban's best judgment as to which decision will be in the best interest of Berkshire as an investor. According to that, Berkshire must have wanted to avoid certain insurance regulations from Washington, D.C. as it related to being a holding company. Berkshire then gave the voting power to the Suburban Trust Company, which was eventually acquired by Nations Bank. Interestingly, in 1995, Berkshire owned half of Geico and made an offer to acquire the other half of it to make it wholly owned. Nations Bank had to vote Berkshire's shares in that transaction to decide whether or not Berkshire would get to buy out Geico. The acquisition ended up going through as Berkshire owns all of Geico today. It just made for an unusual situation. To close, 
When I was reading this annual report, I kept thinking about the movie The Godfather. The position of consigliere is an important one in the movie. The consigliere is the right-hand man to the Godfather. Near the end, Michael removes Tom Hagen from this role. When Hagen asks why, Michael says, because you're not a wartime consigliere. Different leaders could be needed for times of peace versus times of war. Winston Churchill might be another example of a leader who maybe wasn't so appreciated once wartime was over. Jack Byrne definitely would have been a wartime consigliere. He was a fighter. The previous management of Geico might have been good people, and maybe they could have done a great job during times of peace. But the 1970s brought about a tough economic period, along with high inflation. At this point in time, Jack Byrne was the right man for the job. That is where I'm going to leave off for today. Eventually, I plan to have an episode or two on how Geico fared in the years that followed this period. Before I do that, though, I plan to switch gears and take a look at some of the early annual reports of General Motors. Thanks for listening. I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks again.